and strengthen and, and build up your people today in your name. We ask, Lord. Amen. Amen. One more time, would you express your love for me even today? Well, good morning. Uh, you can take your Bibles out and open them to Genesis chapter 2. Get this situated. Uh, for our guests, my name is Steve Heitland. I'm one of the pastors here. We're very glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, I did want to mention I've been told that Richard Sensenig is here. Is he here? There he is. Very glad to have our brother back with us uh, to worship the Lord. Uh, all right, Genesis chapter 2, as we continue our series in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, as we look at how the Lord created the world, created us, and what that means. When the astronauts of Apollo 11 prepared for their historic trip to the moon, they knew that they were stepping into very dangerous territory as pioneers, seeking to be the first humans to rocket through space, to land successfully on the moon, and then to exit the lunar module and walk on the surface. No man had ever walked on the moon. And at 10.56 p.m. on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first man to do so. And his words are justly famous. That is one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. His words marked that occasion with an appropriate grandeur and sense of perspective. You may remember or, or at least seen the video of Walter Conkright, right? he was America's newsman, and he, he took off his glasses and he, he rubbed his hands. He said, oh boy, with this big smile across his face. It was an epic-making moment. Well, this morning as we come to Genesis 2, we will hear words that far surpass even that momentous event in importance. This morning we'll hear the first recorded human words in history. But those words come at the very end of our passage. So though you may be the kind of person who likes to, to skip to the end in order to see how things turn out, I'm, I'm asking you to stay with me this morning and to allow this story to build slowly so that we can appreciate these words more fully when the time comes. Genesis 2 is a profoundly important chapter in Scripture, and especially so when its every teaching is being directly challenged as we are facing today. It's no overstatement to say that Genesis 2 flies directly in the face of the values that have triumphed in contemporary culture. It has become exhibit A of how the, the world judges the teaching of Scripture to be oppressive and toxic. And part of what that means is that we all have been conditioned. We've been indoctrinated with a, a knee-jerk opposition to at least some aspects, if not the entirety, of this passage. Most every powerful institution in our world despises what we are going to find this morning in the Bible. They hate it, and they are actively working against it. But their resistance is futile because this is our Father's world. And he does not negotiate terms on who we are and what it means to live in his world. He is both sovereign and good. And so his design for mankind is wise and beautiful and true. What we're really facing today is two competing visions of humanity, two competing visions of reality. Are we as persons the product of random chance plus time and therefore sovereign over our own lives and identities? 
Or are we creatures? Granted, life is a gift and imbued with design that is as inescapable as it is good. Are human nature and human flourishing something that we define? Or does God set the terms of who we are and how we are to live? Since you're at church this morning, I'm assuming that you know already how we'll answer those questions. But since you're a 21st century American, I'm also assuming that there are aspects of those answers that you may well not like or instinctively affirm. And that's the problem. So what we want to do this morning is to look closely at Genesis 2 with fresh eyes, considering its message carefully and in context so that the wondrously profound weight of its significance can impact us anew. We need to gain and clarify the the positive and life-giving message of this chapter. We're being called to celebrate God's good design for man so we can flourish amid the chaos. Celebrate God's good design for man so you can flourish amid the chaos. And, And just two notes here at the outset. The first is, I'm using the term man the way God does in his word, which man can mean a particular man. It can mean uh, the male of the species, but it's also used for mankind. Man, male, and female. And so using masculine reference for the generic whole is the scriptural practice. And secondly, I want to note for singles, since this text is dealing with Adam and Eve and talking about marriage, Uh, You might feel like, oh, that that doesn't apply to me, but it it profoundly applies to you, right? Uh, On the one hand, you you never know when or if you may get married, so there's that application. But even independent of that, we are all male and female. We have male or female. We have masculinity or femininity, and those design features are God's good and wise plan. And so this chapter is looking mostly at how that works out within marriage, but it applies in all that we do. And so we need to listen to his word and consider, okay, how, how do I uh, enact biblical piety, which is a gendered piety, it's masculine piety or feminine piety? What does that look like in life? And so I want to encourage you to, to look to this text that way. So we want to celebrate God's good design because it is, it is a very good design so that we can flourish amid the chaos. And so we're going to look at this under three heads. The first is the place for man So let's read Genesis 2, verses 4 to 14. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pashan. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gahan. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east out of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. This passage begins with the first instance of what will become a repeated formula in Genesis. It's used ten times in Genesis. These are the generations of. And they're used most often with a personal name, and it's referring to the progeny of a particular man. But as it's used here, it's a transitional phrase to introduce a record of events. And so we could translate it as such is the story. So we're being given more insight into the story of creation. But there's a couple of key changes here in Genesis 2-4 that differ from Genesis 1, showing us the specific focus of this chapter. And the first change is the rearranged order of the words. And so in Genesis chapter 1, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that same phrase is often repeated in Scripture in that order, the heavens and the earth. But here in chapter 2, the phrase is not just repeated, 
it's also inverted in verse 4, the earth and the heavens. And what's signaled by that inversion is that our focus is moving from this truly cosmic, big picture focus of Genesis 1 to the much more earthbound scale of this chapter and of most of the rest of Scripture. We're focusing on conditions on the earth itself. And there's another important change in verse 4. In Genesis 1, God spoke and God created, and, and the term used for God, Elohim, emphasizes his sovereignty and his transcendence and his greatness as the creator. He is the almighty God who creates all things by the word of his power. But in verse 4, another term is added to that title. He is the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh is the covenantal God, the Redeemer, who loves and saves his people. So taken together, these two developments in verse 4 set the stage for what we're going to read. The, the covenantal God, who is the Almighty, is going to work on the earth for his covenantal purposes. And that means we should expect to find a focus on mankind as the only creatures who were created in the image of God for that covenantal relation. And that is indeed what we find. Verses 5 to 9 give us the first explicit purpose for man in this passage to work the ground. The Lord God formed, uh, and the imagery is like a, pot, a potter. He formed the man out of the ground, verse 7. And there's, there's a well-known play on words there because the Adam, the man, is formed out of the Adama, the ground, the dust, the earth. We also find that the Adam re receives the breath of life directly from the Lord God. And so these two actions show both the craftsmanship of God in informing the man skillfully and the relational presence of God in breathing life into the man's nostrils, face to face as it were. They also show us something else, something that John Calvin highlighted some four centuries ago. Consider how humble and fragile we are. God formed us out of the dust out of the lowliest of the elements of the earth, as Calvin noted, the body of Adam is formed of clay and destitute of sense, to the end that no one should exalt beyond measure in his flesh. He must be excessively stupid who does not hence learn humility. Friends, let us not be excessively stupid or even a little bit stupid. We must be humbled before our Creator. We are but dust. We also notice that the man was not created in the garden. First, he is formed, and then the Lord plants a garden in Eden. So you have this region, Eden, and within it is a garden. And then he places the man whom he formed in the garden, verse 8. And that word Eden seems to have this connotation of luxuriant pleasure and delight. And the terminology for a garden here indicates something more like an, a stately English garden, not one of our vegetable gardens. It's a place of order and beauty and symmetry, a place that's clearly been designed to purpose. And then the Lord also forms trees out of the ground and highlights two especially. And he waters the earth out of Eden as the waters rise and flow out into four great rivers that bring life throughout the earth. There are several important points to notice here. And the first is, again, we see the preeminence of mankind in creation. It's clear that the earth has been formed for him. He is the, the ruler of creation. In our day, there's much talk about caring for the environment and about stewardship, and that can be good and right, and stewardship is a biblical term. But what tends to be lost in our day is the language of dominion. But remember, just a few verses earlier in Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and the birds and the livestock and over all the earth. We were created to exercise dominion over the creation. And the clear implication from the commands of Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth while exercising dominion is that as man spread over the earth, as they were fruitful and multiplied, that they would bring that order and beauty and symmetry of Eden, of that garden, more and more to cover the earth with image bearers, glorifying God in their dominion. And as the earth was filled, that, that order and beauty 
would spread and become evident. And I, I think we feel that in our bones, even today, on some level. We all enjoy bringing order and beauty and purpose to things, whether it's working the earth as a farmer or a gardener, or, or building something like a home or an engine, or, or bringing order and beauty through a flower arrangement or, or a beautiful and fine piece of art. You can bring order like an engineer with an Excel spreadsheet or, or a mother assembling ingredients into a delicious meal that feeds and sustains her family. There's many, many ways that we exercise order and dominion over the earth. Mankind is not a parasite. The earth is nowhere near overpopulation. And we need to get rid of the scarcity mentality. When I was a child, the prediction was of a coming global ice age. That was in Time magazine. Uh, and, and that widespread famine and death would soon rule the earth. Well, in the intervening years, that script has exactly reversed with the same level of accuracy. So much of modern environmentalism is anti-God and anti-human and irrational and repeatedly wrong while never in doubt. Genesis 1 to 2 teach us that marriage is normative and that children are normative and that exercising dominion is good and what we are created for. And we will discuss that more under our second point. In the text here, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on the, the rivers and the geography of Eden, in part because it's likely that they were significantly disrupted by the worldwide catastrophic flood of Noah. But we do need to consider the importance of those two trees in the center of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Much speculation has been advanced about these trees. The tree of life is a recurrent theme in Scripture. We'll see it next week in Genesis 3. We've seen it in the book of Proverbs as a figure. And, and most importantly, it appears at the very end of the Bible in Revelation 2 and especially in Revelation 22 where it comes with the new Jerusalem and it bears fruit every month for the healing of the nations. It's yet another sign of God's kindness and his generosity toward us we will those who have trusted in Christ will see the tree of life someday that's an amazing promise but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the site where man is tested it's clear that Eden the garden was not designed to be man's final estate the man was placed within a garden for a probationary period a period of testing and the tree becomes the object of that testing for the Lord God forbids the man to eat of it and much speculation has been put forward concerning what knowledge the tree offers. What's it mean, the knowledge of good and evil? But from the rest of Scripture, and it seems best to see it as a way to assert moral autonomy. The knowledge of good and evil belongs to God. And man was created in the image of God for dependence upon God. We're not created to be independent. We're created to look to him and depend on him. And we'll have more to say about that in a minute. We also recognize that in giving the trees, not just these two trees, but all the trees, the Lord gave them to be pleasant to the sight and good for food. And part of what this teaches us is that the physical world matters, that aesthetics matter, that beauty matters, that taste matters. We can't look at the world around us without amazement at the lavish, and some would say extravagant, exuberant delight of color and texture and smell and beauty in God's world. As Jonathan Edwards wrote years ago about God as the source of everything, it is no argument of the deficiency in a fountain that it is inclined to overflow. God is so very alive and so very vital that he is inclined to overflow into an abundance of life. The fecundity of God has produced a world so abundant and so overwhelming that even on this side of Genesis 3, where it's tainted by sin, we can't help but be overwhelmed. So considering man and his context and considering all of the many, many ways that the Lord manifests his goodness to us, we must celebrate God's good design for man so we can flourish amid the chaos. Which brings us to the second point, the mission of man. So let's read verses 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now we come to what has been one of the most overlooked aspects of the creation account in modern discussions and arguments about manhood and womanhood, because it's here that man receives his commission from God. The Lord placed him in the garden, 2.15, to work it and keep it. And those terms are used later to describe the role of the priests in the temple. There's no doubt that, that the man here is filling a priestly role in the garden. And the garden has temple-like aspects because it's the place where God's presence is specially manifest, just like the temple to come. Part of how this is important for us to understand man and woman comes as we recognize that the woman has still not been created. The Lord has formed the man, and he has formed the garden, and he's placed the man within it, and he's commissioned the man. And so Adam is there as the priest king. He's ruling over the garden under the authority of God. He's responsible to God for all that he says and does. He is to exercise dominion. And the term that has been used for this rule of men all throughout history, including through all of church history until the recent past, is patriarchy. And patriarchy means father rule. And it recognizes the role of men as called and equipped by God to lead institutionally in his world. In our day, it's also been identified as public enemy number one, to be hated and deconstructed by all right-thinking people. That's probably part of what led the group of men and women known as the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood to coin an entirely new term, complementarian, in Danvers, Massachusetts in 1987. And as they would later write, if one word must be used to describe our position, we prefer the term complementarian, since it suggests both equality and beneficial differences between men and women. We're uncomfortable with the term traditionalist because it implies an unwillingness to let scripture challenge traditional patterns of behavior, and we certainly reject the term hierarchicalist because it overemphasizes structured authority while giving no suggestion of equality or the beauty of mutual interdependence. Now, complementarian is a fine word that highlights that men and women have complementary, we've been created for complementary roles. But there are significant assumptions in there that that during the past three decades have shown that complementarian is not enough because it, it minimizes or ignores altogether the nature of things, the issue of nature. By focusing on roles that we fill, they have set to the side the question of nature and of design features. So does a woman just happen to be a wife and a mother? Or does her body and her feminine nature fit her for those roles? Scripture makes many, many arguments from nature, arguments that frankly appear ludicrous to modern men and women because evolution and egalitarianism have taught us that we get to decide our essential beings, not God. So we use the word complementarian here, and it's a fine word, and we're not looking to argue semantics, but we need to recover a biblical vision of patriarchy that recognizes that the roles that we fill as men and women are tied to our natures. And they affect all that we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They affect us everywhere we go. We'll actually see more of this under the third point. And it it also will become evident next week in the curse in Genesis 3. But I want to raise the point because A, it may be an argument you haven't heard. And B, we need to recognize how thoroughly God's good design is meant to walk out to inform our daily living. The man was created and commissioned before the woman even existed. We cannot recognize the significance of the word helper as applied to the woman a few verses later without understanding that it's in reference to this specific call upon the man. Paul makes this point in 1 Corinthians 11.9 where he teaches us that neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. The roles that we fill in God's world are not arbitrary. When the Lord created each of us, male or female, he shaped our lives in profound ways. And so the temptation is to take our sexual identities as male and female and to either overemphasize or underemphasize both the sameness and the difference. Male and female have both sameness and difference, and both parts must be held together. And right now, the world is focused almost entirely on sameness. 
Androgyny, which is the obliteration of distinctions between the sexes, has been an essential feature of paganism from day one. There's, what's going on in our world right now, there is nothing new. This has been going on since day one, and it is just resurgent in our culture. Paganism denies these distinctions. It denies that there's a creator-creature distinction. It denies that there's a distinction between good and evil. It denies that there's a distinction between male and female. It wants to flatten it out. All is one. So sodomy was one step in denying that. And the transgender craze is just the latest and fullest expression of it. The modern West has been thoroughly captured by egalitarianism, flattening distinctions. To de- and so they want to deny such a thing as normal. That's what the Q stands for in the LGBTQ. Q, queer, means to get rid of the idea of normal. It's, it's a verb. They need to queer everything. There is no normal. Okay? Everything is whatever you want it to be. And so they want to get rid of normal and bring us all to the same miserable place. But God's world is not that way. And that's part of how we know that these, this latest, these latest moves won't last because they can't last. God's world teems with hierarchy. It's filled with hierarchy. There is structure and order and authority everywhere. If you own a business, you have authority over your employees and even over your clients to some extent. If you have a home, you have authority over your home. It's yours. If you are a husband or a parent or a teacher or a police officer, you have authority. You bring order to God's world. God's world is filled with hierarchy. It is not egalitarian. And that's part of what makes it so very, very good. And you need to consider that. What the world would be like without hierarchy and without authority. Anarchy. Chaos. Chaos. Men have always ruled the world and will always rule the world. The question is, will they be good men or evil men? Will they be men who recognize and submit to the authority of God so they serve him in their rule? Or will they be wicked men who reject God and therefore use and abuse others? The rejection of patriarchy has not been without reason, but the answer to abuse in Scripture is not to get rid of the good thing as though that would somehow end the abuse. The answer is to trust Christ and to walk in humble obedience before him so that we love and lead in submission to him. The implications and application of patriarchy are not much spelled out in these three verses. This is the ground. We'll see some of them under the next point and some of them play out in the rest of scripture and I'll allude to that briefly under the next point. But Adam's creation as the firstborn His rule as the federal covenantal head of mankind point to God's design for men in this world. The fact that patriarchy is such an uncomfortable topic for, I would imagine, most of us speaks somewhat to the way that men have ruled poorly. I think it speaks more to our own discomfort with authority and submission, right? Whether we're called to exercise it or submit to it, and also to the way that the world has successfully jammed us. That authority is bad. It's why we've tended to trade within the church the biblical terminology of rulers for the term leaders, and why that term is almost always prefaced by the term servant, as in servant leaders. But what most people mean by that is that service that others may or may not choose to follow instead of leading as a means of serving others. That difference is important. If we don't see and affirm the goodness of father rule, we will not be able to function in faith in our father's world. And we will miss significant doctrinal truths that ought to be a strength and support to us. So as we see and affirm the goodness of God's design, we can flourish. If you're a man who's been entrusted with authority by God, you must submit to God. He is the ultimate authority. And and you submit to him in faith in part by leading those he's entrusted to you. Caring for them, leading them, directing them in faith so that they can flourish and God will be glorified. Our world is suffering deeply from a grave affliction of fatherlessness. I remember years ago I went to Jamaica and the illegitimacy rate was 50%. 
One out of two children born to a home without a father. Right now in America, the, the illegitimacy rate is 40%. Four out of ten children being born in America right now are born into a home without a father. That is a devastating curse upon our land. That is a source of tremendous evil and suffering in our land. When men do not rule and lead well, everyone suffers. Society disintegrates. The provision and protection that women and children should enjoy, that they deserve from God, are removed. The, the wonderful complementarity of a father and a mother together in a child's life is damaged. Our society has been on a destructive suicide mission of destroying men and families and foolishly believing that that's the path of freedom and joy. Instead, we've sown the wind and we're reaping the whirlwind. We've rejected the Heavenly Father and we're paying the price. But as Christian men cry out to the Lord for grace and step into responsible roles and lead in the way that he has called us to, we bring grace to those under our care. We protect them from harm. We provide for them. We direct them to truth and justice and goodness. We, we offer a compelling witness to the world of the goodness of our Heavenly Father. And he blesses our efforts, however meager they may be at times. And of course, you, you do you see the connection? When, when a man is being evaluated to be an elder, what is the primary area that he's evaluated in? He must manage his household well. How is his wife and children doing? Are they thriving? Are they growing in the grace of God? Men, that, that is the opportunity and calling that God gives you, that those entrusted to your care and leadership would thrive. That's the, the compelling testimony to the world of men who know and love and fear the Lord, that those under them might thrive, might enjoy the grace and goodness of God. It, it is a profound testimony. There's always a choice. So we're either ruled in love by our Heavenly Father and by the authorities that He establishes, or we're orphans on our own. And that's the dynamic that is reflected in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think that's why the Lord places the prohibition immediately after the commission that He gives to the man. So the tree offers the opportunity to try to gain independence from God, to, to be morally autonomous, to define good and evil for ourselves. The, the tree offered the, offered the opportunity to try and circumvent God's structure, his morality, his authority in the world. And so it's this, the command not to eat of it is a test of obedience. It's a test of submission to God. It's a test of whether or not they will affirm and walk in the goodness of God. And the threat of death includes both physical and spiritual death. The, if, if the man ate of the tree, he would experience death in his body right, the end of his earthly existence, and more profoundly, death in his soul. He would experience the curse and alienation from God. And those topics are addressed much more in Genesis 3, so I'll leave that for next week. So as we prepare for our final point and for the, the culmination that this passage has been building to, we need to remember to celebrate God's good design so, so that we can flourish amid the chaos. That brings us to our third point, the woman for man. It's important for us to um, appreciate the buildup that has occurred all the way through Genesis 1 and up to this point as the angels witness the six days of creation. Every day they see God speak wonders into existence, and every day he, he renders the judicial verdict of good. He creates, and it's good, and his, his creation is entirely good. And, and we also know from the end of Genesis 1, that on the sixth day, the Lord looks at it all, and he deems it very good. But remember when he does that. It's at the end of the sixth day, after his work is, is done. And so in here in Genesis 2, we're still reliving the events, the details of that sixth day. And so the Lord has not yet pronounced his creation very good. And it's at this point in our text that we hear some startling words. And so let's read Genesis 2, 18 to 22. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. 
And out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the, every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord, Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. It is the Lord himself who identifies the deficiency in his creation. The aloneness of man is not good. It's a problem that needs to be rectified. And we know that this is not some discovery, some new insight for God. It has been his plan all along. He never reacts. He is the sovereign God. So when Scripture offers us these kinds of insights into the divine purpose and process, it's, it's highlighting, it's emphasizing something for us. And we saw this in Genesis 1 when the creation was proceeding at a, a pretty brisk pace. But then on the sixth day, the, the text slows way down and we're brought into the intra-Trinitarian counsel of God as he says, let us make man in our image and likeness. Well, similarly here in Genesis 2, the narrative has been moving fairly briskly. And so the creation of the man happened in just one verse, right? Verse 7. But when it comes time to create the woman, the text slows way down again. In over eight verses, the Lord initiates an elaborate process that culminates in the creation of the woman, which would eventuate in that final verdict of very good. The story is artfully told. The Lord identifies the problem, and then in what might appear to be a side note, he brings the animals to the, the man to be named. And in Scripture, naming is an act of authority, and it even remains that today. Right? Your parents chose your name. Uh, you, if you're a business owner, you chose the name of your business. If you have a pet, you name your pets. Scientists that discover an animal will name that animal. And all throughout Scripture, it's the same way. The one who names things is the one with authority. We saw this in Genesis 1 when God called the light day and the darkness night and the expanse heaven. Well, here in Genesis 2, the Lord brings the animals to the man for him to name them. And Adam, the man, exercises his kingly authority in naming the animals. But he's also being taught a lesson, a lesson that the text made explicit in verse 20. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Did you catch what's different in that verse? It's the first time that Adam is used as a proper name. All the way through this point, he's the man, the man, the man, the man, the man. But here, he's specified and called out as a particular person, a particular man, Adam. It's not good for this man to be alone without a helper fit for him. So the Lord puts Adam into a deep sleep. He removes a rib and, and he uses that rib to make into a woman. The man is formed out of the dust. A rib is made into the woman. And so the, the formation of the man is like a potter with clay. But the shaping of the woman is like a craftsman with a, a finely tuned and, and delicate piece of art. And those dynamics are still reflected among us in, in, in our bodies. Men's bodies on the whole are larger, they're harder, they're denser, they're, they're more utilitarian and designed for physical labor and protection. And women's bodies are softer and smoother and more beautiful and designed to give and nourish life. Our nature matters. So the woman has been crafted by God to be a helper fit for the man. She was created for him. She corresponds perfectly to him. She's like him in as much as she too is created in the image of God and accountable to God and, and, and designed to rule at his side as the queen of the garden. But she's also unlike him in ways that complement him and supply what is necessary for them together to fulfill the task that the Lord has entrusted to man. Man could not be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth without woman. Man's role is more outward facing into the world as he, he looks to accomplish the mission that the Lord has entrusted to him. He's created outside the garden and given the task of dominion which aligns more with the, the first three days of creation and so he names and tames and rules. The woman's role is more inward-facing to the home and to her people as she's created within the garden 
and looks to help the man in his task by bringing her God-given strengths to bear in the roles and relationships that the Lord has given to her. Hers is a role of filling, which aligns more with days four to six of creation. And so she fills and glorifies and brings forth life. Both men and women contribute to this God-given task of filling the earth and exercising dominion. And they do it with complementary natures that walk out in complementary roles. Masculine leadership in the world is supported in Scripture by Adam's role of being created first and in serving as the covenantal head of mankind. And so in 1 Timothy 2, Paul demonstrates this within the context of the church. He says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over, over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For, so here's the ground, Adam was formed first. Right? Then the woman, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And so Paul is using Adam's role as the federal head and the woman's uh, natural weakness with deception as grounds for male leadership in the church. And Adam's authority is also demonstrated in his naming her. Both here he names her as the woman, and then later in Genesis 3 he names her as Eve, the mother of all living. In addition, throughout Scripture, the husband is referred to as the head of his wife. That's 1 Corinthians 11, that's Ephesians 5. The wife is commanded to obey her husband, to respect and submit to him. And the husband is commanded to love and cherish his wife, to provide for her needs and to work for her holiness. The scripture does not teach that every man is the head of every woman. It does not teach that women generally must submit to men generally, nor that men generally must love and lead women generally. There are hierarchies and structured relationships within God's creation. Patriarchy does mean that men are designed by nature to rule, which also means that men are called by God to assume complete responsibility for those that he has in his providence assigned to your care. Whoever the Lord has entrusted to you, you are called of God to assume responsibility, complete responsibility for them. So in God's world, authority and responsibility and accountability always go together without exception. Authority, responsibility, and accountability. And of course, one of the premier examples of that is next week in Genesis 3, where Eve eats and Adam is held accountable. Right? She's the first to sin. It's also seen in the pattern. I, I'll let Pete preach that. Um, what there isn't in God's world is freelance influence. God gives authority and influence. And those who receive gifts from God are accountable to him for how they exercise them. Wouldn't that change social media if the influencers thought about giving accountability to God. 1 Corinthians 11 makes that plain because it says the husband is the head of his wife and Christ is the head of every man. There is no account, unaccountable influence or authority. So patriarchy means that men are responsible for the hard and often violent work of protection and resisting evil and that when a society sends women out to battle in warfare or in policing, that society has failed. Women are designed to nurture life, not to take it. Our modern society has sought to liberate women from childbearing, elevating abortion to sacramental status as they make clear that they not only hate femininity, they hate children. Like their father, the devil, they hate the image of God and his good design for us as men and women. I don't have time to go into the many, many ways that Scripture details how our natures play out in the roles that the Lord has given us in the world. But it is far more than headship in the home and eldership in the church. To be masculine or feminine is far more glorious than that. It applies to all that we do and everywhere that we go. Well, I do need to move now to the final verses of this passage. I promised at the outset that we would hear words today that are much more important than those uttered by Neil Armstrong 54 years ago, and so we do. As Genesis 2 winds down, we witness the father bringing the bride to the bridegroom. And if you've gone to a wedding, you've seen this, right? Bringing the bride to the bridegroom. And Adam waits expectantly, and he does what many men after him will do when beholding their beloved, he breaks into poetry. 
And remember, these are the first recorded human words in history. Right? God sovereignly inspired that these would be the first recorded human words in history. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. These words are a cry of deep delight. The man is truly and fully delighted with the woman. It's only after this moment that the aloneness of the man has been rectified. It's only after this moment that the design, divine design for humanity to cover the earth with image bearers who will glorify him can be fulfilled. It's only after this moment that the Lord will pronounce his creation very good. As moderns who've been profoundly affected by egalitarianism, we can easily make the mistake of thinking that if fathers rule, then women must be second class. They must be less than. But that is not the biblical logic. Inequality in rank, rank, right? Hierarchy can and does coexist with equality in value. And more than that, it's our differences that it's in the differences that the, the glory and the joy of man and woman are found. In 1 Corinthians 11, man is referred to as the image and glory of God. And woman is referred to as the glory of the man. And so she is the glory of the glory. She is doubly glorious. As Doug Wilson seems fond of saying, if men are the beer, then women are the whiskey. They're more potent. It's glorious. Modern egalitarians find it inconceivable that hierarchy can produce anything other than misery. But it's egalitarianism that produces misery. It's the flattening out of differences. The joys of being men and women are largely found in our differences, and those differences must be recognized and appreciated and celebrated. In commenting on why the woman was crafted from Adam's rib, the Puritan pastor Matthew Henry wrote, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, Adam not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. John Calvin had a similar uh, interaction with that idea, but he, he took it even further. He said, something was taken from Adam in order that he might embrace with greater benevolence a part of himself. He lost, therefore, one of his ribs, but instead of it, a far richer reward was granted him, since he obtained a faithful associate of life. For he now saw himself, who had before been imperfect, rendered complete in his wife. And in this we see a true resemblance of our union with the Son of God. For he became weak, that he might have members of his body endued with strength. On the side of Genesis 3, we have to fight to recognize and recover what the Bible teaches about mankind and about our natures and roles as men and women. We have to resist the lies that have produced such bondage and destruction in our society. And as we do it, as we trust Christ and repent, confessing our sins and receiving his forgiveness, we grow up to be the men and women that he has created us to be. There is a great need in the world for healthy marriages that produce godly offspring and productive households. The full meaning of the events of Genesis 2 lay hidden for thousands of years. Adam's words of delight at the woman were but a foretaste of something even more glorious and celebrated. And in Ephesians 5, Paul famously tells us that the mystery of marriage refers to Christ and his church. So Genesis 2 reveals to us not only the purpose of mankind on the earth, not only our natures and roles as men and women, but also something of the love of God for the people of God. Christian marriage is a wonderful picture of the gospel and a a foretaste of the delights of the age to come. So we must seek to understand and to practice and to enjoy it as fully as we can. And in that way, we will celebrate God's good design for man so we can flourish amid the chaos. Let's pray. Father, we desperately need 
your word and your spirit. We are but dust. We are frail and fragile. We, uh, there is sin that so easily entangles us. There is so much confusion and destruction in the world around us. And in your kindness, you give us your word and you work by your spirit in our hearts and in our minds, in our affections, to transform us so that what might seem to be foolish would, would come to be seen as the wisdom of God and the kindness of God and the goodness of God. We, we want to be men and women who live for your glory. We want to be masculine and feminine as you've created us to be. We want others to see in us the glory of our Father. And so I pray that you would work. You, you know our hearts. You know our frames. You know our sins. Please convict us of sin. Please deepen our love and trust for you. Please deepen our understanding and conviction of righteousness so that we can live for your glory and for the good of those you bring into our lives. Even as we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face, when we will eat of the tree of life, and when we will know love and joy and peace in all of their perfection. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.